Praise the Lord. So glad you chose to worship with us this morning. So glad the rain has ended. Why don't you stand and let me read over you Psalms 103. This is a good psalm. You ought to read the whole thing. Those of you watching online, why don't you take this time and just set it aside so that we can enter into his presence. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Now listen, all that is within me, that means everything. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Verse 2, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Did you know you have benefits? Think about it. You have benefits. You have a benefit package you haven't opened yet. It's time to open that package and see what God has provided for you in the blood of Christ. Who forgives all of our iniquities. Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from destruction. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's skip down to verse uh, 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will He keep His anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is His mercy towards those who fear Him. And as far as the east is from the west, So far has he removed our transgressions from us. I don't know about you, but that's good news today. So let's bless his name and let's receive all the benefits that he has for us today. Holy Spirit, help us to know our position. Help us to know that it's not based on performance, but it's based on who we are and whose we are in Christ. May we come into this house today, those watching online, those at home, those at work, May we come and we find grace. May we find mercy. May we find what we're looking for, which is Jesus. Wrap your loving arms around this body of believers. Wrap your loving arms around the church of Jesus Christ. May they realize that their valentine is Jesus because he loved us and he gave his life a ransom for many. I pray that as we worship, we just worship with abandon, Lord. We just give you it all today because you deserve it all. You're worthy of it all in this place today. So come, Holy Spirit, and do what you do best. Lead us to Jesus. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen. Come on, let's worship. Oh, your heart. 
today. Hallelujah. Amen. Before you're seated, why don't you give a COVID wave to somebody and tell them you're glad they're here. Tell them happy Valentine's Day. Wave at the camera and the guys in the back. And you may be seated and watch the overhead for the announcements for this week. everyone, I just wanted to give you a quick update on what's been going on out here in Zambia. This year I'll be going to six different villages to partner with their local church to plant youth centers. I'll be teaching courses on the Bible, life skills, micro enterprise, and leadership. My goal is to help grow the local church in order to reach their communities for Jesus Christ. I want to say thank you so much for your giving, for your encouragement, and for your prayers. I know things are becoming increasingly more difficult across the globe, but I also know that God has not changed. He is still on the throne and he loves us with an everlasting love. God doesn't abandon or forget even the smallest sparrow. How then could he forget or abandon you? Even the smallest details of our lives matter to God, for we are more valuable to God than anything else in this world. Thank you for your impact in Zambia. Welcome to Riverside Church. Let's take a look at this week's announcements. Join us for prayer Wednesdays at 9 a.m. live on the Riverside Church Facebook page. Send in your prayer request by posting it in the comment section of the live feed. That's Wednesdays at 9 a.m. on the Riverside Church Facebook page. Join Pastor Grant on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. for the School of the Spirit. Pastor Grant will teach about the person of the Holy Spirit, how to hear his voice, and build an intimate relationship with him, as well as the fruit of the Spirit, how to worship in the Spirit, and more. Seniors, you're invited to Luncheon with the Clays on Thursday, February 18th at noon. Meet outside on the patio, bring your own bag lunch, and enjoy the music and ministry of Randall and Carolyn Clay. Call Peggy to RSVP. Thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. We are glad that you're here. And parents, I just want to say thank you for uh, giving us a little bit of grace today as we've had to move some things around. Many of you know that we're in the process of changing the flooring in our classroom building and also in the youth center. And so our kids are in the cafe and in uh, Pastor Sue's office, became the nursery today. Uh, they never know what's going to happen. They just show up and their office has moved. So um, lots of things going on over there. Thank you for giving us that grace today. Lord willing, we'll be back over there next week as we go through the process. On the um, process of changing the flooring, we have bought enough tile to do the entire building over there. And so um, the problem we have is that we only paid for the tile. We did not include the labor for the um, snack bar area, which is quite large, about uh, 1,800 square feet over there. And so I'm going to ask you here in the next few weeks, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a, a plug for that to help us finish that building. And then we're done with our Vision 2020. We've redone the entire building inside and out. And so um, because we did not put that in, we went ahead and bought the tile because by buying the tile ahead of time, not only does it match, but also we got a better deal and a better price. And so we would love to get that taken care of. There's a couple of corrections that we need to make in that building. Many of you don't realize, but uh, when we came to the river in 1989, in 1990, we built that building. Our men actually, um, we, we hired out the the uh, concrete work and stuff like that, but we did the interior. We did all the walls and stuff. And so sometimes when it's not square, that's problems that we have to correct. So um, that's why we don't build buildings anymore. So help us with that. But anyway, we'll be presenting that to you. We don't have all the details on that. But uh, us together, working together, we can see the kingdom continue to be established and continue to take care of what God's blessed us with. Wouldn't you say that God's blessed us with a pretty piece of property? Amen. 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 
We have a nice swimming pool, too, now on the side of the church over here. It's got clear water. It won't be there long, but it's absolutely beautiful. And then all kinds of other good things that are happening. Make sure that uh, late, uh, seniors, that you're here Thursday for the Clays. We love Randall and Carolyn as God continues to give them the ability to travel. And uh, we appreciate that they're here with us on Thursday to be able to minister to you. So come enjoy the patio. And you don't have to worry about COVID. We'll space you out and have all that stuff like that. And so God's good. Amen? Amen. 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 Who's a happy, hilarious giver today? Oh, looky there. There's a happy Valentine's from my grandbaby. He had some professional pictures taken over in Lakeland from a friend of ours. And so uh, we wanted to share those with you. And he sends you hugs and kisses. That's what his bib says. And then on his blue outfit, it's all X's and O's because he's a hugger and a kisser. He does not know COVID. Come on, somebody. Amen. So I tell you what, that's happy Valentine's to you. Four people in 180 gave their life to Christ on Wednesday night when Zachary shared on purity. And so we're so uh, appreciative for that. I know that blessed not only Zachary, but it blessed the team over there. So that's what you're so into. So easy ways to give. The app is the easiest way. But if you'd like to give in person, it's two stations at the front, two stations at the back. And so let's stand. And if you have your gift today, if you already gave online, you can just hold your hand over your other hand because we're planting our seed today. Why? Because we want to see our seed produce a harvest. When it rains in Israel, they say that's the blessing of God on the land. Well, we want him to bless the seed that we're planting so that we can see the kingdom established here and around the world like Zambia, our sweet Amy Singleton, one of our 30 missionaries all around the world. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to give. We don't have to, we get to. We give back a portion of what you've blessed us with through your tithes, our offerings, our faith commitments to missions so that we see the gospel spread around the world and right here at home. We're thankful for the four young people that surrendered their life to Christ Wednesday. Hallelujah. That's what it's all about. Lives touched, hearts changed as we simply give. So bless it now. Meet every need. In Jesus' name, and everyone says, amen and amen. Come on, let's give. Oh, oh, oh yes, hallelujah. Te adoramos, Señor. Oh, yes,
song comes from. It's the blessing that God told Moses to tell Aaron to speak over the children of Israel. The reason that he gives that, and they speak it many times, they still speak it in Israel today, it's because the children of Israel had just come out of bondage and slavery over 400 years. They didn't have their identity. They didn't know who they were. They didn't have their position assured that they were the children, the sons, the daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he told Moses to tell Aaron to speak that over the people as a declaration. Now, the unfortunate thing is they didn't receive it right away. As a matter of fact, they longed for Israel, they, or for Egypt. They longed for the leeks. They longed for the, the bread that the Pharaoh would bring them to their table because they were dependent on the Pharaoh. They weren't dependent on God. That would all change, of course, as God would provide, not only from the water from the rock and also from the manna from heaven and the quail that would come by day. But obviously at this point, they didn't know who they were. They were still trying to earn the right to be heard by this God they thought was distanced by performance instead of by position. Ladies and gentlemen, I encourage you today to realize that God still speaks this to you that you are no longer slaves to sin, but Jesus Christ has come to speak this blessing to you, to your children, to your children's children. Some of you are standing here today saying, I don't have any children. Yes, you do. You have a lot of spiritual children. You don't realize the lives that you're impacting and the people that you're touching. You say, that doesn't count. Yes, it does in the kingdom. You need to draw a line in the sand and say, devil, I'm tired of you taking what doesn't belong to you. You need to declare and claim 
the promises that we talked about in Psalm 103, the benefits that Christ has afforded to us because we're grafted into the vine. You need to declare today that you're not going to let Satan have what belongs to God. You see, he had to declare this over them so they literally realized the benefits they had that they can go in and plunder the very courts of darkness and take back what the enemy thinks is his when it belongs to him no more. Today, I think that what we should do by faith, some of you are, oh, Pastor Grant, just get on with the word. I, I'm tired of worship. Worship isn't about you, friend. It's about the Father. It's about the Lord Jesus. We don't do this to fill time. We do this for Him because He's worthy of it all. Let's declare this today. Let's declare the favor of God over our lives, over our church, over our city, over our nation, and over our world today. By faith, let's declare it. Lift your hands and turn your face towards heaven and let's declare it to get today. Come on. Oh, yeah. May His favor be upon you in the thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May His presence go before you and behind you and beside you. today, Lord. So be it today, devil. Father of all lies, accuser of the brethren, the one who brings condemnation and shame. We're no longer who we used to be, but we are a new creation in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We're going to stand here today, and yes, we may be going through trials and tribulations, we may have done stuff that's not pleasing to the Father, but He still loves us. He still lavishes His love for us in this. We know that based on what Romans 5, 8 says. For God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. Even before we've ever received the free gift of salvation by grace, Daddy is saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. I don't love you for what you do or what you haven't done. I love you for who you are and who I want to make you. So I pray today that, Father God, every one of your people in this house and those watching online at home, that they would receive the understanding of their position and they'd stop trying to perform. Because really, they're a bad actor anyway. They're not going to win an Academy Award. Because, Lord, they're going to come up short every time. So may we relish. May we absolutely just come to the place to where we're absolutely enamored with the fact that we have been saved by the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we can lavish ourselves in His love, mercy, and grace today. I pray, Father God, for your church that they would decide today that they are no longer going to let the enemy have their children. There's some who they need to call their children back. They need to call them back by faith today. It may look like an impossible situation. We just sang a song that promised us for our children and our children's children for a thousand generations. So today, Lord, we say, devil, take your hands off of God's property. They may be wandering in the desert out there. They may be doing things that are unpleasing to the Father. But yet, Lord, you've called them, and yet, in their sin, you still love them. So we speak by faith. 
We speak by faith, Lord. Devil, we tell you, take your hands off of God's property and our finances. You have no authority in our finances. We're asking for the blessing of God. We're following what the word says. We're giving our resources, blessing the kingdom, Lord, doing what we're supposed to do. And so, Lord, according to your word, you bless and you multiply and you meet needs. Because the scripture says, if you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, you will rebuke the devourer. So rebuke him today. Rebuke COVID-19 and its effect on our economy. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. We rebuke this crazy notion that they would stop the flights coming into Florida because they are jealous of the absolute unbelievable economy that we see here because of the balance that our governor has. Yes, we realize that the variant is there. Yes, we realize that the disease needs to be stopped. We get that. But we know greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So we thank you that this body of believers and those watching online and any person that claims the name of Jesus Christ, I pray a protection over them from this crazy disease. And if they have it, I pray healing in the name of Jesus because one of the benefits is that you heal all of our diseases, Psalms 103. So today, Lord, do your work. We declare that the kingdom of God is here and we're going to receive it by grace through faith. Father, we speak healing over these on our list that need a touch from heaven. Lord, Pastor Ronnie Barber, he needs a touch in his knee as he goes for surgery, Lord. We pray that before he gets there, you do a creative miracle. You restore the cartilage and all the things that are wrong there, Lord. Take away the pain. It's caused his back such pain. And so right now, as Ronnie's watching us at home, we just pray that you'd cover him with your mercy and your grace and your healing power in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray that for Pastor Ed and Miss Ingrid, Lord, healing in their body today, Lord God. Touch his shoulder from the surgery he had, Lord. May the therapy be swift and smooth and may everything go as planned, Lord. We pray for Philip, my uncle. We curse that prostate cancer in the name of Jesus and pray healing. We pray for Jeff gravely, Lord, that you would just continue to heal his body from the surgery and the closed artery that he had, Lord. Thank you that now that blood is flowing freely. We pray for this one uh, of Jeannie Foxworth's friend who's expecting a child, and the child, they're saying, has renal failure. Father, we pray that you would do a creative miracle in that womb right now, and that you would cause that child's uh, body to respond to your touch and your voice. Breath of the Holy Spirit, blow on her right now, Lord God, and minister to that child, Lord God. Help her not to be afraid, but help her to stand firm and believe that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. You can heal even in the womb. Thank you for the story that Dee told me of her great-grandchild today and how they thought that that child would be stillborn. But yet, just last week, it was born five pounds, five ounces, healthy and whole. Kira. Little baby Kira, breathing and perfect. Lord, we thank you for that. So, Lord, do it for this one. Lord, for Chuck and Robin, healing. For Chuck, we curse cancer and we pray for healing. And for Robin, we pray for her liver that you, Father God, restore what the enemy has tried to kill, still and destroy. For little Joshua, my cousin, who's suffering with Crohn's disease and seizures, Lord, I just pray right now. He's only 20-something, Lord, and he needs a touch from heaven. First, Lord, take away the stress take away the anxiety. Help him be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication. Make his requests known to God today. As he's in church with his dad and mom, I pray, Father, that you would just begin the work right now in his body. For Aunt Thou, Lord, we just leave her in your hands, knowing that, Father God, she knows you. She loves you. She has a relationship with you, and no matter what, Lord, you can heal her on this side, or she can go on to her eternal reward in heaven. Because we know the promises says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So we trust, Lord. We trust. And we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your healing, Lord. Thank you for healing our little grandbaby, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that everything they said was there is not there. And, Lord, even the small thing that's there, Lord, is perfect and it'll probably disappear. And thank you, Lord, that when the doctor heard his heart, they said his heart beats like music. That's what they said. It's amazing. So thank you for that, Lord. If you're sick in body today, take your hand and place your 
uh, hand on the part. If it's personal, place your hand over your heart. Let's pray in faith today that God can touch. You say, this is the way we have to do it. Right now with COVID it is. But the Lord says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So we're going to lay hands on ourselves today. Amen. So those of you at home, if you're sick in body, lay your hands where that sickness is right now. And let's speak by faith. Lord, we declare that the promises, the benefits that Christ has given to us in what David wrote about in Psalms 103 and what Jesus took on his back and in his brow and on his hands and feet and side, that by those stripes and piercings we are healed and whole. He bore our sicknesses and our diseases. And so, Lord, we just speak healing wherever sickness is right now. We curse it in Jesus' name. You didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. You came to bring life. So, Lord, we speak life to every part of the body that's being raised up to you by the laying on of hands today, Lord. And by faith, would you bring healing, Lord, right now. If they're at home, bring healing. If they're in this house, bring healing, Lord. And may they know beyond a shadow of a doubt today by faith that, Lord, you're, you have touched their body. And they can claim their healing just like they claim their salvation by grace through faith. In Jesus' name. Lord, touch our nation. Minister to our leaders. May they be born again so they govern according to your will, not their own. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Lord. May your people see Jesus, the Prince of Peace, so true peace comes. And all across the community today, Lord, as the body of Christ gathers, wherever they meet, Lord, kiss them with your presence. Save lost souls, set captives free. Fill them with your presence and your power, and may they encounter you just as well, because, Lord, we want to encounter you too. But we love you and we praise you today in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Oh, come on, say it like you mean it. Come on, let's give you some praise. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. Give them a big God bless you today. Amen. Again, thank you for bearing with us, moms and dads, as we... I have a little bit of a hiccup over there in the other building. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be back in the classroom building and uh, have all of our classes intact. We're doing the best we can. Thank God for all the other spaces that we have, the cafe, the patio, um, just offices. We'll use anything for Jesus. Amen. That's what the pods are outside for. No, we're not moving. We're just storing. And so that was the easiest way, and that was a God idea. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 32, and I'm going to totally wreck the guys in the back because I'm skipping about eight slides, seven or eight slides. I want to go back to the return to the encounter where we talked about Jacob's encounter with God at Bethel, where when he was running from his brother after taking, uh, circumventing, if you will, the blessing. It bothered me all week that I, I kept hearing the Holy Spirit because I was going to go in a different direction. And I kept hearing the Holy Spirit say, you're not done with Jacob. You're not done because you missed something. It's Valentine's Day. How many of you are excited for Valentine's Day? If you don't have a sweetheart, guess what? You've got a sweetheart. His name is Jesus. And he loves you so much that he sent the Holy Spirit to tell me yesterday to go buy every person in this room some Valentine's chocolate. So the ushers are going to come through the aisle with a glove on, and they're going to give you Valentine's chocolate today. They're going to give you kisses from Jesus. Because, number one, you need to stay awake, so caffeine out of chocolate will help. Not chocolate-covered pretzels. Those are only for the pastor. Special anointing on chocolate pretzels. But you're going to get some chocolate kisses from Jesus today. And he says, Happy Valentine's. Do you know that you don't have to fight for the favor of God? Do you realize that? You do not have to struggle to get God's attention. Jacob, Jacob wanted so bad the blessing from his daddy, and this is the part I missed. The part I missed was, the reason is, is because who did Isaac really love? Esau. 
Esau. Now remember, they're twins. Remember? Remember they born? Remember when Esau came out, who was holding his heel? Jacob. And so Jacob circumvents, that's what his name means. Some people mean, think it means deceived. I've looked all through the Hebrew and didn't say that. It says circumvent. It means to go around. And so basically his mother and he decided that they were going to go around um, Esau and get the birthright for Jacob because he didn't feel like he had the birthright. He didn't feel like he had his father's attention. He didn't feel like he had his father's love. He didn't feel like he had his father's approval. And, you know, this is the most amazing thing because most problems in our world today with men and women are they never had the approval of a father. They call it the um, dad-shaped hole. They call it father wounds. You go to psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors and they have classes and books so thick that you can't even imagine that deal with the fact that many people are just longing. Many people, the way that they act or react or deal with situations is they're trying to get their father's approval. And so when their father dies, they're even still trying to get it. And so they do things. Um, oh, I get into so much trouble. A lot of why President Trump acts the way he acts is because he never had the approval of Fred Trump. So you got to know the backstory. A lot of people don't know President Trump is a teetotaler. He doesn't drink. Why? His brother, his oldest brother who was his idol, drank to excess and died from alcoholism. He told his kids that if they uh, ever drank that he would write them out of the will. Because he says drinking just causes foolishness, takes away from your resources. So it explains a lot, doesn't it? Oh, I'm making friends today, I can see. When you look at people and some of the way that they act, you can see very quickly that the lack of or um, the inability of an earthly father can cause some problems. And so for Jacob, that was part of the issue. He, he had some heavy father wounds. The problem was, and for all of us is the same way, is, and boy, you can see the uncomfortableness that I'm making some people right now. I can see the people twist. I can see the, you, 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 by the way, your body speaks, lang that's why they have body language class, you know. And I'm, I've read three books on body language, and I can tell the way people are thinking. And, you know, they put their hands here, or, they, or they, their body language is stout. It's amazing to see. Everybody just stop looking at me. <laughs> Let's just have a praise break for a minute. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. But it's true. It's true. Jacob was the same type individual because he didn't feel like he had. He had the love of his mother. That was, <laughs> that was without question. But that's not who he was looking for the approval from. So he circumvented. On his way to escape from the wrath of his brother for taking the blessing that would require and give him the rights to the to the, be the heir of the family, the patriarch of the family. He has an encounter with God. And I want you to notice that if you didn't miss it, or if you missed it, you, you didn't catch the fact that he called it Bethel. He didn't call it El Bethel until later. Bethel meaning the house of God. And I want to bring something to your attention. It's not in my notes, guys, so don't get nervous. But turn to, turn to Genesis 32. Turn to, we'll be there in just a minute, but... I want to start in a weird spot. Let me put on my glasses so I can read this small print. Verse 3 in Genesis 32 is when now Jacob is returning after 21 years of servitude to his uh, father-in-law, his uncle uh, and father-in-law now, uh, Laban. And after being accused of stealing and getting all his blessings from Laban when really it was the hand of God and they knew that it was the hand of God. They make uh, a treaty and they make a covenant that they're not going to cross each other's paths anymore. And he releases uh, his daughters, Leah and Rachel, and his um, uh, servants. And he says, I release you, my son and my grandchildren, to go live your life. 
and this stone will be the marker. And so verse 32 is where we pick up, chapter 32 is where we pick up, I want to read from verse 3. When he's coming back in the 21st year to uh, Canaan, when he's coming back uh, to the place where his father is, by the way, his father has not died yet. That's amazing because they thought he was on his deathbed. The old coot won't die. Verse 3. <laughs> Verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the, county of, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Speak thus to my lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and donkeys and flocks and male and female servants. And I've sent to tell my Lord that I find fa that I may find favor in your sight. See, he's trying to appease. He's trying to come to the place to where uh, he can get his brother to not be angry with him. And obviously, he's not yet come to that place where at the second encounter, which we read last week, he changes the name of the place where he met with God the first time. And he called it Bethel, but he actually calls it El Bethel because he's actually come into contact with the God of the house. Verse 6 says, Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he also is coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. It didn't say Esau and his wives are coming with a welcome wagon and a basket of fruit. It says... Esau and 400 men. Verse 7, so Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. Somebody say, duh. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the, the company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. And then Jacob said, now I want, you to, I want you to pay close attention if you're reading with me. I know it's not on the overhead, and I'm sorry for that, but Holy Spirit kind of gave this, dropped this into my lap this morning. Verse 9 is so telling. Remember, this is before he goes back to Bethel and he meets the God of the house. He still only knows him as that distant. That's my dad's God. Look, I'll prove it. Verse 9, then Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your family and I will dwell with you, deal with well with you. I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I've crossed over this Jordan with my staff and now I've become two companies. And then he prays, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother and from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will truly treat you well and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for, uh, numbered for a multitude. It's interesting that when you come to the place of encounter, there's always stuff that you have to deal with. Most people want the pastor to always stand up at the podium and tell other people about their stuff. But you know what? I've found I don't even have to tell you about your stuff because you know what your stuff is when you came in the room. You, knew, you know what your stuff is when you sit in the stillness of your house watching television or not watching anything. And the Holy Spirit says, have you dealt with that yet? Jacob had to come face to face with the very thing that he had dealt treacherously with because he had circumvented the will of God, the, the, the plan of God, and although God takes our messes and turns around and makes his miracles because he takes all things and works it for his good, right? If he does that for Jacob, why doesn't he do that for you? He does. See, we all know what we have to deal with. We all know the place that we have to come to. And then for Jacob, he couldn't have the El Bethel meeting, El Bethel meaning he met, met the God of the house so that God would be personal to him. It wouldn't just be the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, my grandfather and my father. It would be his God. He, he would meet the God of the house. He had to go through a wrestling match. He had to go through a time and a season where he dealt with some things and that there's a beautiful picture if we will look at it and see, Holy Spirit will show us some things so that we can have our encounter. So I want to return to the place of encounter. 
I want to go back to the place of encounter, and I want to see some things that God wants us to see. So let's turn to uh, Genesis 32. Genesis 32, verse 22 through 29. Guys, the back television is not on, so if you can help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Verse 20, you know, President Biden, he has to stop because he can't keep up with the, um, the teleprompter. Neither can the pastor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It has nothing to do with age. It has to do with equipment. All right. There we go. Verse 22. And he rose that night. This is Jacob. Okay. And he took his two wives, his two female servants, the other two concubines, the, the servants that were given to him, his, uh, the ladies' maids, and his 11 sons and crossed over. By the way, remember 11. Why? Because Benjamin has not been born yet. Okay. And they crossed over the ford of Jabbok, and he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had, and then Jacob was left alone. So I want you to see, he, he's gotten rid of his possessions, he's sent his, his wives, his children, and his men and his servants onto the other side, and he is alone now, okay? He's alone with dealing with the issues that he has to face. He's alone with what he's fearing the most, which is to face his brother, who 21 years ago when he left is very angry and very upset and very mad and very frustrated. And so here he is alone, and that's the best place in the world for God to get our attention. Some of you watching at lo alone at home, you're watching alone because... Obviously, you know, whatever the pandemic or whatever your mind is telling you, and, and you think you're alone, but you're not alone. First off, you have a body of believers that loves you here, but also you have a Heavenly Father who wants to deal with some issues in your life. This is not a time to flip, flip over to Netflix and binge on your favorite show. Go to Hallmark and watch all the Hallmark craziness for Valentine's Day. I don't know how they work that because we're not supposed to be gender, so I guess, anyway, we'll just move on. Some of you are a little slow. You'll catch that later in the parking lot. How's that going to work in Hallmark World? Anyway, I'm sorry. I'll go on. So, But you need to realize that God wants to deal with you right where you are. Verse uh, 24, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him. Until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he, did not, that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So here again, Jacob, go back one slide. Here again, Jacob is still wanting to have approval in this case, from who he's wrestling with. Many believers and, and scholars and theologians believe it could be he's wrestling with God. Others believe it could be the angel of the Lord. We don't know, but obviously it is part of God's company. And so he's wrestling and he's not letting him go because he's longing for something. He's longing for something that he already possesses. Some of you in this house today and some of you watching online, you're wrestling for things that you already possess. When you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, nobody put a gun to your head to come to Jesus. He offered salvation and you had to either receive it or reject it. Everything else that He gives to us is the same way. We either Accept it or we reject it. I, I'm amazed at the people who don't believe in healing, but then they get sick and they read every, bi every scripture in the Bible about healing because their opinion has changed. And now they're ready by faith to receive healing because they need healing. See, when you wrestle with these kinds of things, all along it's been there. Can I tell you something today, church? You don't have to fight for your position. It's already been paid for. You, you've already been bought with a price. See, we're, so many of us in this room, we're trying to perform. We're trying to do the right thing. 
We're trying to make sure there's some in here right now that you're frustrated. You know why you're frustrated? Because you're so afraid that Pastor Grant's going to find out that you're behind in the reading through the New Testament for the year of 2021. As a matter of fact, you're still back in the book of Matthew. And you're so afraid that Holy Spirit's going to give me that word of knowledge. And I'll call you out. Performance. Do you know God isn't concerned that you're not in the book of John because by now we should be in the book of John? He's just concerned that you open the darn book. Because for years, some of you, it was just, you know, pfft, blow the dust off. Hello. See, it's not about performance. Should we be where the pastor wants us to be? Of course. There'll be a flogging later. See, we're, we're trying to perform. Or that we blew it last night or we blew it this morning with our wife instead of or our spouse. We, instead of, you know, being nice to them because it's Valentine's Day, which we should be nice even when it's not Valentine's Day. We should buy flowers even when it's not Valentine's Day. Flowers are expensive, Pastor Grant. Let me help you with that. If they're expensive, do you know that you pass on US1 a place where you can get them free of charge? They're free. And those people will never miss them. <laughs> Pastor Grant. I was never able to get this past Michelle because she just knows. But a former girlfriend that I had many years ago. You knew I was going to tell this story, didn't you? Because, yeah. So, so a former girlfriend that I had. When I first came to this church, she was with me for about six or seven months until she realized what the ministry was all about. And... Um, when I used to work at Central, and I would clean up after the funerals, and Pastor Buddy, he was like, he was marrying Sam, and he was the undertaker. I mean, he did more funerals. And so most of the families didn't want the flowers, and most of the families didn't want to have them taken to the, to the cemetery because then you got to pay for another vehicle from Strunk and from Cox Gifford and all that. So they'd leave them. So what I would do is I would take the flowers, and I'd pick out and make bouquets. And I'd set them on this gal's car. Oh, she thought I was wonderful. Never let on. By the way, she married an undertaker. Just thought I'd let you know that. I know some of you are offended right now, but think about it. Do the dead even care? Okay, just thought I'd let you know. All right. So there you go, guys. Flowers every day. Just don't get caught. Amen. <laughs> See, it's, it's not about your performance because your performance is going to be weak or it's going to be great in certain, you know, levels, but it's your position. Let's go for Valentine's Day. Position. You're, you're her husband. You're her, his uh, wife. Position. That doesn't change. We are sons and daughters of God because of Jesus. Is he happy with some of the things we do? No, he still loves us in spite of what we do. It's position. Oh, he's preaching better than you're saying amen, but that's okay. Bless me, bless me. Verse 27, so he said to him, what is your name? This is the angel. This is God. He already knows, but he says it. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. Why? Because circumvent. Circumvent, to be able to, you know, deceive. He says, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And then they go on through this whole dissertation about who I am, you know. Here, here's the key. The key is he is now contender. That's what the name Israel means, to contend, to struggle, to fight with. Because they have to struggle. They still contend today. Do you realize that? 
They struggle with the UN to be able to be a justifiable nation. They struggle even right now with our own nation as they're beginning to think about some of the policies that were so blessings to them uh, in the past four years. Now they're beginning to question those. Uh, thank God they're going to keep the embassy in Jerusalem. They should. But uh, the key is that they begin to question some things because they, they don't understand Israel like you and I do. And that God's hand is there. Friends, let me tell you something. The blessings of God are on the United States of America because we've done exactly what the Scripture says. You bless Israel, I'll bless you. That's what he says. It's not me. That's the, that's the chapter and verse. So he changes his name to contender, to the one who struggled and made it. Why does he change his name? Because he has to change his identity. Because, listen, if you don't have an identity change, and every single one of you, if you've accepted Christ, guess what? You've had an identity change. Because the old person was buried, Lord willing, in the tank of baptism. Raised to newness of life in Christ. The old person was baptized in the Holy Spirit, Lord willing, and purified with fire. Because what the water couldn't wash out, the Holy Spirit would burn out. See, your identity has changed. You're no longer the old person, but you become a new creation in Christ. I want to give to you five things and then a bonus, because everybody needs a bonus today on Valentine's, of how to learn to wrestle in the encounter. Because wrestling is different than boxing or fighting. Wrestling, uh, not that stuff you see on TV, you know, with all them crazy people. No, 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 no. If you've ever watched wrestling in the Olympics, it's different. And your, your job is to pin your opponent to the mat. And so there's, of course, you know, rules and, and things that you have to do. Like there's a, a certain amount of space that you can't go past. And so because you, you've got to try to do it with your body. Well, obviously, Jacob must have knew something about wrestling. And, of course, obviously because of dealing with an older brother who already had the favor of his father and what he longed for, I'm sure he learned to wrestle real quick. But for us... There's some things in this story that we need to also come to grips with because every single one of us is wrestling. I've never thought that I'd have to preach this much on this topic, but many people, and those of you watching online, we are wrestling with fear. Those of you that still believe COVID-19 isn't real, I pray that you come out of the clouds and realize it's real. It exists. But that doesn't mean you have to be afraid of it. Sharon's a nurse. Steve's a nurse. They don't have to be afraid. It can, it can cause issues, yes. And for some reason, it's weird because every time they think they figure it out, it changes. And, you know, oh, oh it was just the old, older people now. Well, I have a 24-year-old friend that just died. Healthy as a horse. Dead. COVID-19. And they don't understand why. And they're trying to figure that out. So that's not to make you afraid. That's just to mean we know where our healer comes from. And we know where our healing is. you got to face your fears. Jacob had to face Esau. He had to come to the place, coming back to his father's house, coming back to the country of his birth, coming back to the place where God said you would return and inherit. And that literally your seed would be blessed as the sand of the seashore. He had to face his fears. And we already read in the first part of chapter 32 of Genesis that he was afraid. He didn't know what he was facing. You can only imagine when he hears the servant say, Esau is coming and he's bringing 400 men. Ay. Ay. How am I going to deal with this, Lord? How am I going to deal with the fact that I've lost income from work because of COVID-19? How am I going to deal with the fact that literally I have to be careful of, of people? I can't do what I'd like to do. I want to travel. I want to do all these things. i got to face my fears. you got to face your fears. Every person in here has to wrestle with that demon, and it's a demon. In Isaiah 41.10, it says this. It says, fear not. Look at your neighbor and say, fear not. This is Isaiah speaking for God. And he's not just speaking to those 900 years ago. No, he's speaking to you and to me. Fear not, for I am with you. Who's the I in that statement? God. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. 
I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Do you know that the Bible says in the book of, I think it's in the book of 1 John, it's either 1 John or in the book of James. Can't remember right now, but Holy Spirit will bring it to my attendance, a remembrance here in a minute. But perfect love casts out fear. Not talking about the gooey stuff that we see on the television for Valentine's Day. No, 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 we're talking about perfect love. Where's perfect love? There's perfect love right there. That one would lay his life down for his friends. God loved us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's how much God loved us. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We don't have anything to fear. Pastor Grant, what happens if I die? Well, um, you get to go to heaven. How sad is that? Wow. No more tears, no more sorrow. I mean, you know, no more pain. We all look good. We don't look fat. We look younger. My hair's turning gray, y'all. I'm just glad that it ain't turning loose. Because if it turns loose, I'm buying me some. I'm telling you that right now. Amen. Will you let me wear some if I buy it? Oh, you gave me the look. Number two, if you're going to wrestle in the encounter, you've got to learn not to let go. Some people are way too easy at letting go. Michelle knows this better than anybody. I have a dear friend who just let go. Pastored a church that he founded. Saw the move of God. I mean, it was amazing. The buildings, the money, the resources. He served with me at camp. He served with me at Bible quiz. And then one day... He just lets go. Caught in adultery. Doesn't want to deal with it. Leaves his wife, his children, his grandchildren, his church. And basically fell off the face of the earth. So the Bible tells us that we're supposed to go after our brother when they fall. So I did, didn't I? I actually drove to Jacksonville, Florida to try to find him. Never found him. If you're watching online today, I want you to know that we love you. Yeah, the father's not happy with what happened, but he still loves you. You're still forgiven. You can be healed, and God can restore you because I know that your children and grandchildren love you. Don't let go. In this time that we're in right now with COVID-19, it's so easy to let go. So many people have let go of their relationship with God. So many people have let go of their relationship with others. So many people have let go of just all kinds of stuff because they can't deal with the stress. I'm not saying there's not stress and pressure. There is. But aren't you glad that we have somebody that advocates for us, intercedes for us? Don't let go. Hold on. Look at what Paul told Timothy. He says, but you, O man of God, flee these things. What's he talking about? All the things of this world, the flesh, all the things that the enemy tries to throw your way. He says, flee these things and pursue righteousness. What is righteousness? Right standing with God. The only way you get that is through Jesus. No matter what you do, and I know this is hard for some people. This is not greasy grace because there is accountability. But listen, let me tell you something. God looks at you so different than most of you look at yourself. Because he doesn't see what you do, he sees who you are. Because it's position, not performance. Godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Nobody likes to talk these kind of talks because we don't like to fight. We want to be lovers, not fighters. Well, listen, friends, if you're going to be in the kingdom, the, Jesus said the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. 
What does that mean? You're not letting go. You're not going to let the enemy come in and just rave havoc in your family and your life. No, you're going to fight the good fight of faith. And look, you're going to lay hold on eternal life. In other words, you're going to lay hold of it and you're not going to let it go. You're not going to let the demon of fear control you. You're not going to let the demon of oppression and uh, uh, depression control you. You're not going to let addiction control you. You're going to forget those old things. You're going to flee those things and you're going to run after righteousness and you're going to run after peace and you're going to run after the love of the Father. Don't let go. Do you know that there are stories in the Bible where the people who wanted favor from God and wanted to hear from God that they would literally go into the tabernacle when they weren't supposed to and the Bible says that they would grab the horns of the altar to where the priest would have to come in and pull them off the altar because they were trying to get a hold of God. They were trying to get God's attention. Can I tell you something, body of Christ? You don't have to do that. You come boldly into the throne of grace because of what Jesus has done. Don't let anybody take you away from that. Don't let anybody, don't let the devil himself tell you that you're not worthy enough. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no shame, no guilt. Holy Spirit just said right now, just whispered in my ear. I'm telling you, I felt this so strongly. He says, there's somebody here, you're walking in guilt and shame. And even now, you're saying that doesn't apply to you. That only applies to others. Don't allow the enemy to tell you that any longer. Don't let go. Hold on. Hold on. Number three. If you're going to learn to wrestle in the encounter, you need to know your identity. Everything I could teach 365 days a year and never complete the fact of helping people to know their identity. Because too many people don't know who they are. Because we, in America, we base everything on performance. You get raises based on performance. You get status in your own family based on performance, what you do. Society, everything is based on performance. Perform, 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 perform. You know, see, this is the problem. The kingdom is so much different. <laughs> because he could care less about performance. He cares about you and you being his. He loves you in spite of you. He loves you in spite of you. Some of you, you're like, well, you just don't understand, Pastor Grant. I'm a good sinner. You're not that good. He still loves you. Now, out of love for him, we should desire to live that holy life. But the beauty is if we fail and if we fall and we will, aren't you glad that we have an advocate with the Father? So the question is, do you know your identity? Do you know who you are? Do you know whose you are? Have you experienced that you are no longer who you used to be, but you are that new creation? Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's why uh, the angel of the Lord or God himself had to change Jacob's name because he couldn't be the circumventer anymore. Now he needs to be contender. He needs to fight. He needs to struggle. He's made it. God's been with him the whole way. Well, that's exactly where you're at. When, they, when the father looks at you, he doesn't see who you used to be, but he sees the blood of Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 through 7 says this. He says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. That's very important, by the way. To redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So when they look at your driver's license, instead of seeing your picture there, they should see an adoption paper that has a red cross right over your face. Because you've been adopted. See, you just thought you were Smith or Jones or Foster or Malone. Oh, brother, Malone. Or Cobb. Or Combs. Or Sparling. Or here's one that my car doesn't know how to say, De Jesus. Calls him De Jesus. 
So I have to say, if I go to get it to call Orlando, I have to say, call Orlando to Jesus. Okay. If it's calling Michelle, I have to call her Michele. If I say Michelle, it'll give me Michelle Morris, the former chief of police here. Sorry, Michelle, don't want to bother you on your retirement. Hang up. Then I go, oh, yeah, call Michele Foster. Hi, Michele. Amen. Don't look at me like that. It's true. We've, got, we've been adopted. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Daddy. What did Jacob want? He wanted Jacob's love. And he wanted his father approval. And he wanted his father's, you know, stamp on him, whatever. And yet that's not who he needed at all. Some of you, this will set you free. You've been looking for an earthly father to give you what you've needed, and you don't need it. Because you have a heavenly father who is oh so much better, who will never leave you nor forsake you, will never let you down, will never disappoint you, will never disown you no matter what you do. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then heir, heir of God through Christ. Do you know what happens to the heirs? When the will is written, you get the benefits. You won't be like Larry King's wife. You won't be wrote out of the will. Come on, somebody. They were in the middle of a divorce. Anyway, I'll build, move on. Number four, learning to wrestle in the encounter. Oh, help me, Jesus. You know, the number one problem in church, and I'm talking about the body of Christ, is unforgiveness, bitterness, unforgiveness, offense. L listen to me just for a second. Hear the heart of a pastor. If I took you all on the bus today and drove to another church, we would find five or six people that used to come to church here. And if we stood on the platform and said, hey, just tell us why. And if they were bold enough to tell us, it would be hurt, offense, and unforgiveness. And when they told us, they would give us chapter and verse. They could tell it in technicolor uh, detail what happened. Right or wrong? Right or wrong? And we're holding on to all this stuff. Now, Jesus said something that really troubles us because he said, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you your trespasses. And most people read that and say, see, you can't get to heaven. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that you literally have put a wall between you and God, and he can't bless you, and he can't use you because you've got this going on. Until Jacob basically humbled himself before his brother and sought the forgiveness that needed to be sought, and in turn Esau gave him that forgiveness... There would be no healing. And God is not about division. But he is all about unity and relationship. So what do they do? They go church to church. And what they're carrying with them is a backpack that gets bigger and bigger. Because let's, guess what? When you get hurt one place, if you don't deal with it, you're going to also get hurt again. And you're going to keep getting hurt. And you keep getting hurt until finally you run out of places to go. And then you sit at home and say, well, bless God, I'm the only perfect one that's ever existed. <laughs> they don't really say that, but that's what they think. Can I tell you something? You're going to get hurt. You're going to get offended. You're going to have reason to see things totally different. Because we all have opinions. We all have views. But that doesn't make it right or wrong. That just means that we have to decide that we're going to still be sandpaper and still love each other. Find forgiveness. Find healing. Let go of what you're still holding on to. Don't be like a 50-some-year-old man who has to lay on his daddy's grave and 
beg God and say, why? I don't understand. And just dump the garbage that he's still holding on to that would ultimately, part of the reason, I believe, cause him to take his life because the enemy says, aha, I have a gate into your life. Now use it because you're holding unforgiveness towards your real dad. Boom. Oh, it got quiet in here. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Look at this. This is great. In Him, Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in, on earth in him. What is he saying? He's saying you've experienced forgiveness of your sins. Now it's time to work on the relationship in the horizontal. That's the fullness that he's talking about there. Of not just heaven, because this is the vertical relationship. We get reconciled to God. We ask God to forgive us of our sins. But then we have to deal with those horizontal relationships if we're going to find redemption. Because if you haven't noticed, I made a cross. And that's all the sign of redemption. Because we have to be in relationship with one another. Jacob had to find that forgiveness to find healing. The beauty of that meeting, if you continue to read chapter 32, is interesting. Jacob has to literally force his brother to take what he calls his atonement offering of cattle and sheep and goats and herds and all these things. Esau's like, no, I don't need that. You know, you you don't have to appease me. We're brothers, you know. I've been blessed just as you've been blessed. The, the healing that was there was just, it's, it's absolutely astounding. And it's exactly what Christ does for you and me. And that's what we need to do for others. Number five, and I'm almost done. Then I got a bonus. If you're going to learn to wrestle in the encounter, you've got to learn the key is humility. This doesn't fit in our culture. Okay, if I didn't make you mad earlier, let me make you ticked off now. Why did the old boy lose after four years? Because he did not swallow his pride. Because politics is all about perception. Yes, you can be the wrecking ball to come in, but you can't be the wrecking ball to stay. And you've got to learn to be able to come to the table. Granted, we all like his personality that he was willing to call spades spades and, you know, diamonds diamonds and call people out even on both sides of the aisle. And, and for that, we'll always be truly grateful. But if you're not careful and you literally think that you are all that in a bag of chips, you're always trying to reach for that approval. Dad, never got it. Had a boy, son. Way to go. Very dysfunctional. You got to have humility. All, all, all of them. It's not just him, but I mean that. That's just what I believe. Whether you believe it or not, that's fine. You can be mad at me right now, and that's fine too. It really doesn't change anything. The Bible says, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, He will lift you up. Jesus, when He came. To be the, the king of the universe, the Messiah, the master, the, uh, just whatever you needed. He came in, in just awe and wonder. Instead of come and stay at the Ritz-Carlton, he was at a stable. And the only one that really knew that he was coming was maybe an innkeeper and a few ragtag shepherds. When he's having his last supper that he paid for, do you realize? He told the disciples, go to this place in this upper room, and there'll be a, a great room, and it'll all be set and prepared and ready for our last meal. He paid for it. He took care of it. He made sure it was going to happen. He's the host, and he's the head. And yet, instead of be the host with the most, 
he humbles himself by taking off his outer garment and covering himself with a tower and washing their feet like a servant and a slave. Because humility is the key. See, when you find that humility is the key, you're no longer wrestling to try to get position and pin that issue. No, no, no. You're finally surrendered to the Father. That's where Jacob had to come. He's wrestling, he's wrestling, touches his hip because he can't win, because he's not going to let go, because he's got that tenacity. He's a contender. He's, he's struggling, and he's going to hold on because he's had to struggle his whole life to get the attention. And so now he comes to the place where he has to face that to really get what you want, you have to humble. Scripture says the meek inherit the earth. Just just understand, in our culture, this doesn't work. The humble usually are stepped on. The humble are usually kicked to the curb. The humble are not treated very well. The humble are usually chewed up and spit out. And yet that's what the kingdom is calling us to be. In 2 Corinthians 12, 5 through 10... We find something that's very interesting in this portion of Scripture. That experience is worth boasting about, Paul says. He's talking about what he could boast in. His education, his ability. I mean, you know, he comes along late in the whole Christendom thing and wants to make a mess of it, but yet there's a lot that he could boast in. He says, but I'm not going to do it. I will boast only about my weakness. What? If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I don't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message. Even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said... My grace is all you need. Most people would tattoo that on their body somewhere, but would they tattoo the next line? My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles That I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The very thing that you may be facing, the very thing that you think is a problem, the very thing that Christ wants to deal with in your life may be the very thing that propels you closer to Him. You just got to change your focus. You just got to change your focus. God wants us to come to the place to where we are absolutely, humility is ultimately just a place of surrender. You surrender your right to fight. My goodness, Americans, we love to fight about everything. Fight, fight, fight. When maybe we just need to surrender. And say, Daddy, thank you that I don't have to fight for my position. I already have it. Daddy, I'm glad that I don't have to impress you because you're already impressed with me because of Jesus. I boast not in anything I've done, but I boast in everything that you have done in and through me. I'll leave you with this last bonus point. Extra. Tip your pastor on the way out, would you? Learn to wrestle in the encounter. The bonus point is this. Position gives you the blessing, not performance. If you're trying to attain God's blessing, stop trying to attain it. You already have it. If you're trying to gain the focus of heaven, stop trying to get it with all that you're doing. You say, well, Pastor Grant, should I read my Bible? Absolutely, every day. But God isn't impressed with Quantity, he is with quality. Pastor Grant, I can quote chapter and verse. Great, wonderful. Has it changed your life? 
See, it's about position, not performance. We'll end with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse oh, 20 through 21. 21 is my favorite verse in the Bible. You know this. Now, when then we are ambassadors, representatives for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be a sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice, you don't have to earn it. You become the righteousness of God. So you can stand and look in the mirror, and even though you might be battered and bleeding, and even though you might be going through stuff, and even though you might be wrestling with issues and challenges, you can look in the mirror and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm not righteous on my account because my righteousness is equated with filthy rags, but I'm righteous because of what Jesus has done. Holy Spirit, would you help your body here, my brothers and sisters, to experience this today. For some, I lost them, Lord, at humility because they think humility means humiliation and that is totally not your character. Because if they will just learn to humble themselves and surrender, you will lift them up. There's some who need to face their fears, Lord. They're afraid. I'm still amazed at the one who came to our church office and said they would never come back to church because we don't require masks. And then I see him at a restaurant, an indoor restaurant, 40 or 50 people walking in the door with no mask on. It's amazing, Lord, we're afraid. We don't even know it. There's some who are so afraid of the economy. When you told us not to trust the economy, to trust you. Because you're the one who gives. You're the one who provides. You're the one who will supply all we need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Help us, Lord. There's some that need to deal with the unforgiveness that they're holding on, the bitterness, the offense. Some even watching by, by the live stream. They, they can tell you technicolor detail. They, they know it backwards and forwards. And that means, my friend, you're wrestling with the fact that you're holding on to it instead of saying, forgive me, Lord, for not forgiving that person. I'm not saying it wasn't right or wrong. I'm not here to be judge and jury on those things. But to hold on to it and to let it shape you and to let it control you. Some just need to realize their identity and their position. Whatever it is today, Lord, help them. Minister to them. Holy Spirit, meet them right where they are. We want to encounter you. We want to know you. We want to be yielded to you in all ways. I pray for those that don't know Christ as their Savior. They're not born again. They haven't confessed and believed, whether here or online. I pray that they'd simply call out to you, Jesus, forgive me. Wash me. I confess you are my Lord. I believe in my heart God raised you from the dead. I call on your name. I repent. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Come into my heart. Forgive me. Wash me. I'm yours. I surrender. Because, Lord, you'll hear that prayer. You'll forgive them. You'll cleanse them. And you'll get them started on the journey. I pray that if they pray that prayer online or here in the house, they'll tell us. They'll let us know. They'll send us a text. They'll call us. They'll grab one of the pastors or one of the staff or one of the elders and they'll say, I prayed with Pastor Greg. So we just want to get them started on the journey. All day long, Lord, may we think about that promise that we're not based upon our performance, but we're based, our lives are based upon our position, who we are and who we are. Give them a great afternoon and may they meditate, chew on all that we've said today. Holy Spirit, do your work in Jesus' name. And everyone says, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great night.